Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show on Reason and Theology, joined by returning guest Dave Gordon. We're going to be discussing all kinds of things uh, related to the state of affairs in the church, Pope Francis, the bishops, and so on. Hey, welcome back to the show, Dave. How are you? I'm doing well, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Good to be here. Oh, it's always exciting to have you on. And so, yeah, looking forward to this. And, you know, today we're going to be discussing some content matter that is a little sensitive. So if y'all have little ones listening, maybe uh, <laughs> maybe circle back to this episode at a later time. That would probably be uh, helpful. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to be discussing some of these things. And then, of course, I want to just let everybody know at the outset, you know, the intention here is to be uh, constructive, charitable, not... Um, not destructive or anything like that. And so uh, please uh, know that that is our caveat here and that's our intentions. But yeah, that being said, we, we do need to touch on some things that are going on in the church course related to uh, church militant where you formerly um, uh, worked and also, you know, the situation there kind of ties in with a lot of things that are taking place in the church with our approach to Pope Francis um the bishops all kinds of things so that's why we're doing what we're doing yeah uh before we dive into kind of details and specifics any preliminary comments that you wanted to offer before we actually dive in let's just dive into it michael let's yeah it. um yeah it, it's good to be here uh again thanks for having me on always good to chat with you and you're such a gracious audience so i always like you know so many places you look at the com boxes and stuff and the audience is uh being being uh almost standoffish your audience is always really gracious so i appreciate Thank that you. like <laughs> you can get a I, complex looking at the com boxes on other things where it's like Man, dave's hair is goofy <laughs> and your audience is always like what a swell guy you are <laughs> i'm glad to hear that that's uh that's that's good yeah let's keep it civil of course in the, in the comment section let's uh, try to be uh constructive uh, here um yeah so let, let's talk about maybe catch us up to speed on you know some of the recent developments that have been taking place unfortunately yet um, church militant and we can kind of build from there sure uh as a lot of you know um my employment there was terminated as of friday kind of unceremoniously and some colleagues and i had banded together to form the a loose fellowship kind of a loose union of employees so we would have a voice to make known our concerns to the board of directors about you know what had been taking place at church militant especially under the ceo tenure of Michael Voris, and then a plan going forward. Uh, so, um, and I've, I've detailed on my channel, obviously, the things that led up to the ouster of Michael Voris and what precipitated his resignation, kind of a forced resignation, and that was um, lapses in his chastity as uh, an SSA man. Um, and so we had brought that, of course, to the to the board that was made known to the board and then they they forced his resignation and of course the board it's their duty um as a 501c3 board of directors to they have a fiduciary duty meaning they have to look out for the best interests of others um essentially whom they're representing uh the the taxpayer of the state of michigan you know we have a special status as a nonprofit. they have to look after them they have to look after the mission statement of this charitable company that of course is getting you know special special status because it is a charitable company um and they have to keep it pure and they they weren't doing that for about 10 years if you know there's a lot of fault and, and blame to go around here but that is number one is that we had a remiss board that wasn't looking after this organization as they had a legal duty to do and that led to all number of problems, including, you know, Church Milton just going away from its original mission statement and becoming this um, bishop bashing. Ultimately, that's what I would characterize it as uh, bishop bashing secular political organization that's lobbying about things like like global warming instead of you know the mission statement of church militant was to defend christ's church against slander and attack and essentially to evangelize and we had gotten far away from that no i'm i'm paraphrasing that but that all happened under the tenure of this do-nothing feckless board of empty suits and these same people who did nothing for so long 
for like 15 years and let the CEO essentially run amok as if he owned Church Militant. And that's a common misconception that I'm even seeing in the comments on my show. Is it somehow Michael Voris because it was his brainchild and he fronted some money for this thing that it was like his company and he can do what he wants with it? No, you, that's not right. Legally, that's wrong. That's not what a 501c3 is. No one really owns a 501c3. If anyone does, it's kind of like the taxpayers or something like that. Um, but the board is responsible for, for, you know, managing and running such an organization. And they did nothing for so long and let it get far away from its mission statement, far afield. And then these people, instead of being like, oh, mea culpa, you know, we messed up when we brought this to their attention. And we're like, yeah, you kind of have these fiduciary duties to us or not kind of you do. And you need to see to your duty of care, your duty of obedience, and your duty of loyalty. You know, those are the three duties of um, the d board of directors of a nonprofit. It, they, they just, you know, they completely defaulted. And then they had the hubris to think that they're going to try and fix it. The same board, the board needs to go. That's the problem. Um, and it, it always was. Obviously, there were sins of Michael Voris that sunk the company. But the board itself is the problem. And to my knowledge, they remain in place. And that's where people need to like be targeting their complaints. You need, you know, church militant needs to get a flood of complaints that this do nothing board who allowed this organization to be run into the ground is still like clinging to power. It's ironic. You know, it's like, where was all this, uh, this ambition when you were letting the CEO run amok? Yeah, I, I certainly want to say about Michael Voris, my, my heart broke when it, when I heard about that information and I, I just, my heart reaches out to him and um, I, I wish him all the best. And, you know, this isn't the end of his spiritual walk. He certainly is in need of our prayers. And I imagine he's hurting severely and deeply in this moment. And this is the time when we need to show him the love and mercy of the body of Christ, the love and mercy that Jesus has for him. Um, and um yeah so so certainly if anybody you know jumps in the comment section and starts bashing him and trashing him and uh gloating and spiking the football over this situation you'll, you'll be immediately blocked i'm not gonna uh tolerate any of that here please just spend all that energy <laughs> um on prayer for him because i i can certainly say if we were in that situation uh we we would certainly want those prayers and we would want to be shown god's mercy so yeah like, and, and i know you agree with that and, and so i just wanted to make that clear for anybody who did not know can i say something on that score yeah sure michael voris has a ton of gifts mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways he's a very charitable man mm -hmm. he is and you know especially um in the time leading up to this but before we were here at crisis point you know you could go to him he'd sit down with you and he actually had in certain ways a lot of humility and he <laughs> would if you were like michael uh, you know this is bothering me um he'd hear you out <laughs> you know there's not that many people that were as well stationed as he would that would do that and in a lot of ways especially i'm talking a couple of years ago he was a really good boss Mm. He, he was and especially i my family will be grateful to him um you know i'd taken a law job during mm. covid and i because of covid i couldn't get the workshop go take the workshop to renew my bar in the state that i was barred in and so i couldn't end up taking the law job and michael voris gave me a job mm. and my family is very grateful to him in that regard yeah um i i feel like when you when certain things need to be talked about in, mm -hmm. in public discourse, people are so quick to just be like villain. Oh, you're all good. And you're all a villain. And that oh, actually yeah. goes into making these cults of personality on the other side where it's like, Oh, well, you know, you know, Michael Voris can do no wrong or uh, Bishop Barron can do no wrong. Yeah. Um, you guys have to understand people are complex and spiritual combat. The, the battles that we're going through in our life are complex and we're a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. We have virtue and we have vice and people are like an admixture of virtues and vices that they're struggling with in their life. But Michael Voris has a lot of really, really good 
virtues mm -hmm. and solid qualities. And he does have fortitude. He, he has true fortitude in a lot of ways. Now, in certain ways, when that's not checked by prudence, it can run amok. So no one gloat in his falling. I'm especially the farthest one to do that. And in a lot of ways, it is heartbreaking because he could be such a strong champion yeah. for Christ in his own way or even offering up these sufferings to Christ. Um, you know, he has a lot to to offer up. Uh, and Christ gives great sufferings to the ones he loves. Mm. Like the greatest saints were always thanking God for their sufferings. So we're not trying to throw him right under the bus. But there is something that needs to be said on behalf of the common wheel, on yeah. behalf of the common good. That's yeah. why this had to come out for the common good, you guys. Yeah. It's not and, an animus. And I, and I wanted to address that because some people are going to say, look, this is detraction. You know, um, some of this was some of the some of the details surrounding this situation were private faults. That is, they weren't yet publicly known. We kind of had an idea, but some of the details were privately known. And then they were recently disclosed. And some people feel like, oh, wait, isn't that the sin of detraction? Can, can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, and I, I did cover this leading up to this um, on my channel when I did the initial, like, what have you, expose. Um, and this is something I'm mold on. And this is why after I put the video up, I put the video up and I, I had gotten like a few hours sleep in the last like 48 hours. So I wasn't thinking yeah. right. And it took me like 20 takes to even have like a decent video to put up because I just my brain was fried. Mm -hmm. So then I, I I had been also weighing this for about the week before. And then I just got nervous after I put it up and was like, I really don't want to have unjustly right. outed somebody for private faults right. in front of a large audience because the you know, look up the the reparations that are needed for detraction. You it's have to go. And, yeah, yeah, it certainly is. And then you have to go and try and you know rehabilitate this exactly person's restore reputation. their good name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's nothing I wanted to play around with. Right. Um. So in the week before, I've been considering considering it, and I was like, I think I'm good to do this. As a matter of fact, I feel convicted that I should do this. But mm -hmm. the last minute, I had second second thoughts uh, had doubts mm -hmm. so then the next day i just went to confession had a really long confession mm -hmm. chatted with the two priests at my parish yeah. got holy communion made sure i was in a state of grace because mm -hmm. leading up to this i was you know i i was afraid i was not in a state of grace especially um you know talking about private fault yeah, yeah. in private yeah. circles yeah. I, I had no idea so i wanted to make sure i was good so then after that after consulting with um a couple priests and some other, you know, good people that mm -hmm. I trust, you know, <laughs> I, I decided to carry it, go forward with it. Um, yeah. and, and the rule of thumb here is that, you know, ordinarily people are entitled to their good name. Um, however, if there is something that's really, you know, if it's if it's necessary for the common good or for uh, people to know this information publicly, um, then yes, that person is not entitled to their good name, and that information can be disclosed. And in this particular situation, I believe you were saying that, you know, this touches on, um, you know, some of the obligations uh, that Church Militant had for its donors and things like that, and so. Uh, for the sake of co the common good, this information could be disclosed because it certainly touches on those things. Did did I get that correct? Yeah, I mean that's most of it. I'll just read mm -hmm. from Joan A. real fast, and mm -hmm. it's one of yeah. the, my oh, my epic. manuals. Oh, yeah. he's epic. Yeah, man. Uh, so yeah. he says, for the benefit of an individual, such mm -hmm. a revelation is allowed if uh, he who is guilty may profit thereby, or if harm can be averted from a third person. Um, you know, I also consulted. Uh, uh, another moral theo guide and just catholic encyclopedia actually is very mm -hmm. helpful here it mm -hmm. says finally even when the sin is in no sense public it may still be divulged without contravening the virtues of justice or charity mm -hmm. whenever such a course is for the common weal or is esteemed to make for the good of the narrator of his listeners or even of the culprit um and then the right to which the the person has to an his, his good name is extinguished mm -hmm. in the presence of the benefit which may be conferred in this way mm -hmm. so yeah i mean there's this common good analysis where it's like okay you have a person engaging in um habitual vice 
Uh, and they're talking about, you know, things that are going to affect people's eternal salvation. And mm -hmm. especially like the tenor with which we spoke against the bishops, which seems to be rooted perhaps in this unresolved vice and in maybe a deep wound from family of origin stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, to point to that and to say that this person is not in the place to be perhaps criticizing the Pope and bishops because they're not doing it in a way that is going to be edifying for an audience. They're, they're going to be misguided and they're going to be setting a tone that's not right for the church and leading people to scandal. I think that's a very legitimate thing. Um, furthermore, because the board of directors seems to be in favor of kind of covering this up saying that Michael Voris was stepping down for reasons of health and then um, bringing him back in a couple years to the, you know, that would be bad for him. That would be bad mm -hmm. for his eternal soul. So this is partly an act of charity to make sure that this is never allowed to happen again uh, to Voris himself. He should never again be in a spotlight. Um, it's hard enough. And I think everybody who has, um, an audience understands this it's hard enough not to speak for prideful reasons as it is if, if you do have uh the right mindset and are living a life uh, of chastity and you know trying to be humble it's hard to do that but especially you know for someone who has had the these grave wounds and mm -hmm. um this deep vice because again homosexuality is not just like the equivalent of you know, fornication. It's one of the Picata Clemencia. It's, it's especially grave and it comes from a twisting of your own identity as male or female. Um, you know, it, it would not be good for somebody like that to be in the spotlight, presuming to lecture other good Catholics on things. It would ultimately, I think, lead to more downfall. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if this person were allowed to come back, I think what's in order, and I'm not a spiritual director, but I think it's quite clear that what's in order is probably a life of behind the scenes prayer and meditation and a life of humility uh, away from the stage. But I mean, and the people have a right to know where their money is going. Also, they have a right to know what is kind of the sit situation of the organization that they're supporting. And so for all these reasons, and, you know, there's more stuff to go into, I, I found that the my conscience convicted me that the common good and the good of Voris, um, you know, outweighed that conditional right that he had to his good name. Because when you are a sinner, you have a conditional right to your good name, not absolute. The only person who has an absolute right to a good name would be like the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, she who has never sinned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all of us have a, a conditional. Yeah. That, that makes sense. That's very helpful. Let's talk maybe about some of the uh, stances of church militant. Um, maybe in the time that you were there, some of the stances that it took that you felt were kind of concerning. Let, let's address maybe some of those. Sure. You know, I think there's a few things that need to be said here, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, church militant was a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. some of the employees are very faithful and deferent to the Pope and bishops. Yeah. Many, I will say of the employees, not many who are left, but um, many like our group, those who are kind of ousted, whatever it is, 11 to 14. I, I don't know the final count of those who are gone now, but I think that I think 13, if I had to um, say, those were the ones that are, were the most faithful uh, barring a few exceptions, because there are still a few ones that had to remain. Um, it, those are the ones that were most faithful. So there, there was a mixed bag of, of people there. Now, some of our content was very troublesome uh, about the magisterium, the way we would cover, especially Pope Francis, with the hermeneutic of suspicion and playing into the, to the trad narrative, um, you know, reading everything he says and does in the worst light as opposed to reading it in a hermeneutic of, of continuity with his forebears, which is our duty as Catholics to do, and our duty in charity to do, to avoid rash judgment, um, to not just be sitting there sniping a document and looking for something that can be ripped out of context to tarnish the character of, well, any man, but let alone the Holy Father. 
So that is problematic and that is still going on. As a matter of fact, I heard that, you know, they wanted all the Pope's planners out. Mm. So I, I enjoy the favor of the board and, you know, tippy top leadership until I opposed them. They're, you know, floating the idea of bringing Voris back. And then I mm. lost basically all favor. It also came to me through the grapevine that, um, they did not look kindly upon quote Pope splainers, which in other words, Catholics, Catholics mm -hmm. seem to be not as much welcome there anymore. Uh, and the tenor, which we covered the bishops also. Now this one is a more difficult issue this is a more nuanced issue, because I think we can all agree that there are some issues that needed covering and mm -hmm. not in a, a favorable way with Let's say the USCCB, some of their initiatives, some maybe what I see as a misunderstanding of, you know, as Thomas Aquinas would say, the right of a nation to secure its borders in accord with the common good. You know, I, I think that their application of the church's certain doctrines of the church on things like that is wrong and, you know, could be called out in, in a filial way. And this is the difference between how we were actually doing it versus what we needed to do. There is a room um, to call out the bishops as sons of the bishops. And this is how Aquinas breaks it down, uh, you know, fraternal correction in a couple of ways. He says you can correct somebody out of justice or you can correct somebody out of charity. Now, if you don't have authority uh, over a person, you cannot correct them out of justice, but you can correct them out of charity. So all Catholics of goodwill can go to their bishops and as sons of the church, recognizing their authority over us and with the due tone um, that goes along with that, they can say, you know, bishops, I I'm coming to you as a son to a father. And I think you have gotten this this wrong. You're misapplying uh, this this false charity to the issue of, say, immigration. And you're actually destroying the common good of the United States because you're bringing in people who are not having enough time to assimilate. Um, they're bringing, instead of assimilating to our culture, they're bringing their culture with them and just kind of setting up conclaves. And then because they vote 70% Democrat, it's destroying the common good because they're giving the party of death almost an eternal grasp on power over the United States. And that redounds to all of our doom you know that's going to harm us all which is of course why the democrats are so in favor of something like illegal immigration another example of that michael would be you know going to the bishops and saying like look you know we love you but you can't cover up sex abuse mm -hmm. uh you can't just take a priest and reshuffle an offender priest to another parish and pretend that all is well and that you know his crimes um, aren't going to be made public because that is going to result in more victims in more trauma at these parishes. So we have a duty to expose this again out of filial love for you and out of um, love for the church and keeping it pure. No organization is allowed to self police, Michael. That's yeah. that's a thing. That's why they call the media the fourth estate in government. You know, because it, it is the fourth check on the other three branches of government. It, it is there and it keeps government honest. And the church is a government. It's a real government. It's a real kind of kingdom. And there does need to be exposure, in my view, of, you know, if it's not if it's not governing itself right. Now, the question is, do you do this as an antagonist? And that's what church militant was doing versus do you do this as a son of the church? But if you're doing your job, even as a son of the church, there's going to be a salutary tension between the church and Catholic media when you, when Catholic media is doing its job correctly, because it will mean raising uncomfortable conversations. Again, not aggressively, not pugnaciously, but the very subject matter of calling out our own fathers for something um, with due reverence, but nevertheless calling them out is difficult and it's something that needs to be done church militant again was doing it they were trying to correct out of justice as opposed to out of charity and there there was this antagonism that entered the picture and that was the tonal thing that i think mm. everybody could understand was off with it so yeah that, that's a starting point for those two things uh, yep. um, 
Yeah, that, that's very helpful because I, I don't think anybody would, or at least I hope nobody would disagree that you can criticize uh, some things in the hierarchy. I mean, canon law certainly allows for that. Canon 2.12, as I've noted many times, you can express your opinion. And yes, that opinion can be critical. Um, so that certainly is possible. And so to whatever extent that happened at church militant in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that. But as, as you're alluding to here, I do think that sometimes it crossed the line from be mere criticism to insults. Um, you know, if you look at Canon 212, it allows us to express our opinions and concerns even publicly. But if it is in relation to the hierarchy, we have to make sure that we are being uh, respectful, respectful to the dignity of their office. And I think that's probably where some lines were crossed at times, maybe not always, but at times with church militant. And, and not only that, Sometimes it went beyond mere criticism or even beyond being disrespectful to a person's office and actually went into public dissent against magisterial authority. That certainly is not allowed for in the Catholic Church. Um, so, yeah, sometimes I think that occurred and to the extent that that happened, that that probably wasn't the right approach. That being said, there's nothing wrong with addressing problems in the church or even exposing corruption, um, you know, in instances that we're morally certain this information that we're disseminating is true. I don't have an issue with with that. But, yeah, sometimes I think it went beyond that. And that's the problem. 100 percent. And you know what else, though, Michael, is curious about Church Milton? And this is where they took some really correct but unpopular stances. Like they do have the courage of their convictions, or they at least they did in the past. And that, as the focus shifted more to being like a, a major media player, it seems like the courage of convictions wilted a bit and we're trying to avoid controversy. It's like, look, if you're going to be a Catholic media organization, you're going to have mm -hmm. to engage in controversy because there's a lot of disinformation out there. There are a lot of bad, cynical um you know, rad trad pundits out there that are saying crazy things. And because, you know, it's been more of a difficult pontificate, people are starting to just believe the rad trad narrative and there's little pushback to it. So you're going to have to take, you know, some stances um, that are going to be make you unpopular. Mm -hmm. You have to have your eye on Christ and be like, you know what? If I have to shrink staff down to 15, then so be it. I have to shrink staff down to 15 because we're servants of God and we will not be stifled in telling the truth. Nothing. We will not yield in telling the truth because that's why we exist. That is our mission statement. But at first we were like that. Think about the stance mm -hmm. on the SSPX. All mm -hmm. these people are pretending like, well, it's a really difficult question whether they're actually in schism. You know, I remember mm -hmm. talking to Steve Skojak about this, like, you know, four years ago and he's hemming and hawing and being like, well, it's a really difficult question. No, it's not. They've been called schismatic by the last three popes. It's mm -hmm. super obvious. They were, you know, Lefebvre and his kind were excommunicated for schism. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's not something that's a tough issue. Just no one wants to talk about it because the SSPX kind of cultists, they donate well. They give you lots of money if you say their things. Uh, if, if you go along, if you goose step along with their narrative and pretend that these issues, that the, the waters are muddied and... Um, you get a lot of money from that. So I always mm -hmm. admired, and Church Militant was right where I was um, mm -hmm. on the SSPX question when I joined from the get-go. And they're right where, you know, Michael Voris would remind staff, like, this is the Holy Father. We're not just going to call him um, Bergoglio. We're not going to do that. This is the Holy Father, whether you like it or not. So we had those those convictions, but then we wouldn't live up to our own convictions. We wouldn't like live up to our own internal memos because there was a gap between um, where where we were supposed to be and where certain middle managers wanted to take us. You got personnel as policy and you have to have the right people as content gatekeepers. And unfortunately, right now, church militant doesn't. And it's given rise to this this gulf, this internal struggle for the company. But the reason guys like me um 
or you know, I don't I won't speak for anyone else. I don't want to get them in trouble. Sure. We're there. It was because we saw the glimmer of hope because we saw that we were trying to be faithful. Um, we did stand up when Taylor Marshall and Patrick Coffin started going what sounded like almost a set of a contest route. Coffin more expressly, uh, Marshall more implicitly with, you know, calling the Pope a heretic and then going through like Bellarmine about what that means. Um, mm-hmm. We did stand up against that. And then the other times we lacked the courage of our convictions. So like the good guys in house were just trying to nudge it over the edge and be like, we need to be strong no matter if it costs us financially or not. And you mm-hmm. know what? People ultimately are going to respect that and we're going to enjoy a divine tailwind. The fortunes mm-hmm. of Church Militant as an organization were always tied to the amount of fidelity, the purity of its fidelity to Christ. And we lost that as with the Mark White book. I can go into that too. You know, I stepped back um, uh, from from wanting to, to sub edit that and edit that all together. And I was like, you know, I have to recuse myself from this. He's defying his bishop. And mm-hmm. if we publish this book it was about a year or so ago, mm-hmm. we will lose the favor of God that we have straight up called it in a meeting. Hmm. You know what what you mentioned there um, about getting rid of pub- Pope Splainers, you mentioned that earlier. I wanted to <clears throat> interact with you on that. Um, I, I kind of noticed that there was an internal division on this question of um, defending the Pope versus slandering him. You know, as you mentioned, it's a mixed bag. There's some good people. There's some bad people there. And you were one of the people who was trying to balance this stuff out. And in fact, you and I had a video together where we were balancing out some of the content that is out there that was slandering the Pope, even some of the content that even Church Militant was promoting. Uh, We balanced it out, and that was pretty quickly canceled. Um, So I noticed that there was definitely a problem there. You know, there there were certainly individuals who were wanting to put forward propaganda false accusations against Pope Francis and didn't necessarily appreciate any kind of um, pushback against that stuff. And, and I think that's unfortunate when we were, when we're in the business of slandering the Pope uh, and disseminating false information about him and then stifling those who would balance and correct this, that's a massive problem. Any comments on that? Absolutely. Uh, again, it goes back to the issue of profit. Mm-hmm. Um, people were freaking out because the donors were and our audience was freaking out. Oh, we're going to lose premium subscribers. Uh, so we need to pull this down before we lose premium subscribers. No, that's mm-hmm. not the right answer. The answer is that you need to continue refining your message organizationally and you need to call your audience. So the ones, the unhealthy members of that audience, sure, I'd love to speak to them and bring them to the right uh, right place theologically, and I'm happy to do that. But if they are going to drop out and that ministry is not going to be effective, I'm not going to pander to them for money. If I wanted more money, I would have been a lawyer from the get-go. Mm-hmm. It, you know, I, I put myself through my theology program while practicing law. You know, I was going over to Franciscan at night to take classes after practicing law during the day i you know it's the other way around i'm not here for money right if i wanted money there's a million other things i could do this is about telling the truth that's what our business is so far be it from me to kowtow to um to to the audience to be some kind of a theological populist that's just being a pimp i don't want to be a theological pimp michael So instead of being like, okay, well, sorry, good riddance, you know, being a premium subscriber doesn't make you like a shareholder in this corporation or something. That's not how it works. Uh, You're here because you're supposedly a man of goodwill, uh, a person of goodwill. And, you know, if the second you stop being of goodwill and you dissent from the teaching of the church and you want to be an antagonist of the reigning pontiff, as opposed to be being united to the Pope, um, then you can walk. And so we built up by pandering, especially over the last year. I, I think this goes hand in hand with perhaps um, some private sins. When private sins were being engaged in, then we took our eye off God and 
you know, we we put our eye more on worldly secular affairs and the almighty dollar. And so we lost our way and we started building up a really unhealthy audience. And you could see it in the comments. Actually, I think one of your commenters in this chat was like, you know, if you ever looked at the comments on their content, it's really gross and unhealthy and it's low IQ. You know, you'd get like a, a big old wall of text with like no periods and stuff or capitalization. It's like, come on, we're we're creating we are attracting the worst audience. And that that itself has to be, you know. Uh, you got to look at why you're doing that. Um, you don't pander to those people. You try and bring them up. And you oh. know, this goes back. I was in parish ministry for mm -hmm. a little while. And my priest was like, I was like, you know, I think you should go deeper um, maybe on some of these homilies sometime. And he's like, well, you know, these people are at like a third grade theological place, th third grade theological education. It's like, okay, I understand you get to a parish and it's really the catechesis is poor, right? But you've been a pastor here for like 20 years. What does that say about you as father? Because as Vatican II said, the, the, the parish is a true family. What does it say about you as father that after 20 years here, your people are still at a you know third grade theological education? You're supposed to be rising, bringing up your audience. You're supposed to be bringing up your parishioners. And if you're not doing that and you're just staying at their level and letting them kind of fester where they're at, you're not doing your job. So we, we couldn't take any pushback. And, and part of that was just eyes on the almighty dollar. In reference to some of the comments, um, look, I, I totally get, you know, in comment sections, you're going to get all kinds of wild stuff. And, you know, you, you, no matter what you say, you'll have some people who are there, you know, who are dissenters and things like that. Um, but I noticed that there was perhaps a disproportionate amount of dissenters and, and slanders. Um, in the comment section, in fact, that, that may have been, in fact, the majority of commenters there would, would meet that description. And at that point, you do have to start to wonder, um, is it not the case that some of the content of that platform is producing, or at the very least attracting, um, you know, so many dissenters and slanderers? Yeah, definitely, definitely is. And especially without the, I mean... Michael, and I think you know this because you cover ongoing church events, you cover breaking church news and whatnot, and it's the the subtleties and the flourishes in your speech or writing that are really going to nudge the audience in either the right or wrong direction as far mm -hmm. as their overall take. So we might be even covering something like a, a bishop that's engaged in some corruption, mm -hmm. and you know we're giving them the nudge to be antagonists as to be as opposed to being sons of the church who respect his office as a successor of the apostles but are calling out what he'd done mm -hmm. and, and that was i think that little subtle edge to the wrong side mm -hmm. that over a long period of time is what created um a very toxic not all of them because there's many good people um many very holy people that also tune into the programming. But I think that explains some of the toxicity of the audience. We are just mm -hmm. nudging them with where there was that editorial room, even in straight news, when there was room for editorializing, the editorializing was the, the part that was noxious. It was the part that was um, poisonous. Um, it yeah. wasn't necessarily the facts, Although, and we can cover this in a second if you're open to it, there were sure. facts that we misreported, and we did do some people dirty. Um, Ooh, yeah, yeah. I, I and I and I do uh, want to cover those. Let me briefly ask you about though, um, perhaps the phenomenon of projection. Um, perhaps some of the things that were going on at the time with um, you know some key leaders and at church militant, uh, perhaps that colored the way they perceived certain clerics, certain situations in the church. And maybe at times that led to an overly excessive or overly critical um, narration on certain events and people in the church due, I think due to right. a projection of internal struggles that were taking place. Yeah, I think that's correct. And this mm -hmm. is why, you know, everybody has a mother wound and a father wound, and this is all very Ignatian. And that actually colors your idea of God. 
You know, your parents mm -hmm. are your models for God, which is why the fourth commandment is in the order it's in. It's the first three about God. Then it goes right to parents before like thou shalt not kill. You know, it goes to your parents because they're your model for God. Um, you know, there's there's that great quote. Mother is the word for God on the lips and hearts of all little children. And it's true. Like how you're brought up, how you are loved is going to actually show you how God loves you. That parental mm -hmm. love is the closest thing that you will ever experience in your life to divine love. Mm -hmm. And if there is a hole there, it creates wounds in your your identity. It mm -hmm. wounds the very core of who you are and wounds your ability to conceive of God, the father's love for you, the mm -hmm. Trinitarian love for you. And, you know, to get over that. You have to go through some spiritual exercises. This is what spiritual direction is all about. It's mm -hmm. not about, um, you know, in my uh, my academic advisor, a very great man uh, at Franciscan University of Steubenville. You know, mm -hmm. he does this. He is like he's a deacon, Ph.D., Marquette um, and is a spiritual director. And he'll be the first to be like, I'm not I'm not grand poobah. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to tell you how to live your life. You, mm -hmm. you know, this is you need to ask God to show you his great love for you, to show you how much he loves you. And this is the way to start getting over some of these wounds you have from your upbringing. If you're not doing that and you have these deep wounds, which often, you know, manifest in SSA, mm -hmm. then you are not in a place to be telling other people how to relate to mm -hmm. these spiritual fathers, the, the yeah. Pope and bishops. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I um, I, I do want to ask about misreports. You did you did mention some of those. Sure. Could could you maybe give us some examples of that? Well, we I mean I can give a couple uh, off the top of my head here because mm -hmm. they're fresh uh, because of some conversations I've had recently. Okay. But um, you know Austin Ivere, we mm -hmm. reported something about him that was untrue and that he had won a libel case against a European um, publication for reporting. Hmm. It, so we picked up a story that was clearly wrong and reported it as if it were true and did damage to this man's name. Mm -hmm. And we did it with John Allen from Crux also about his, his, his marriage and whether he was shacking up with a new person didn't go into um, the issue of annulment or whether his relationship was was chased. We were seeming like we were saying it was unchaste mm -hmm. from what I understand. Um, and of course, I had nothing to do with these things, mm -hmm. but that those are things I was made aware of very recently. And if you do that to somebody, mm -hmm. you owe them a public apology. You don't just whistle past the graveyard and pretend you didn't do that. You if they didn't do these things, they have an absolute right to their good name with respect to those things. And to go mm -hmm. out and destroy it, their their good name in that respect is a horrible act of injustice. And even if like it doesn't make business sense, this is where if you're a Catholic media organization, it's not the almighty dollar. It doesn't matter what makes business sense. We are here by the grace of God. And it ple if it pleases him to keep us, our meager, paltry, pathetic organization in existence. And to the extent that we do not strive to do what is right and to be upright men, we will lose the favor of God and he will show us who is boss. He will show us that our, our organization does not deserve to exist. So it should be incumbent on us. I mean, we should be kept awake at night not being able to sleep if we've slandered people and it appears that we have so we need to make public reparations for that and and publicly retract um and ask for the graciousness of these people that they would accept our apology and you know that's yeah yeah it's really hard to expect god to bless an organization you know if that occurs i i could certainly at least attest to some of the in misinformation about Pope Francis, um, you know, what one issue was the whole Pachamama thing, right? Yes. And both you and I were mistaken on this as well. And both you and I have publicly apologized for that. In fact, you did so at, at Church Militant during one of those episodes. But then yeah. I see they turn around just a few days ago and once again slander Pope Francis with the Pachamama accusation again. Um, kind of undoing that that apology that you had offered. Um 
so that that's truly unfortunate you know so yeah yeah it's not just some some of those individuals in catholic media it's especially slander against the successor of saint peter which is certainly a massive issue well you um, know michael mm -hmm. i think i owe i you know sent this a pri sent austin Ivere a private message the other day apologizing for some of the things i'd said on rules for retrogrades about him i believe with regard to pacamama mm -hmm. or pachamama i don't know mm -hmm. if it's a mm -hmm. um and uh, you know I, I have to retract those publicly as well mm -hmm. you know i i went after some people that i thought were enabling the pope francis when i did think it was idolatry um those, mm -hmm. those incidents were idolatry and i went after people and i was wrong so to all of those who i may have forgotten that i went after i i issue this heartfelt apology and i hope you'll accept that oh yeah and i appreciate that i think you had also mentioned a few days ago in another video about how church militant owes an apology to the bishops and you know i had a comment who came in the comment section earlier and uh, completely misunderstood that and said apology to the bishops for what for an apology for their sexual molestation of children and it's yeah it's like you know um so some people just don't seem to be capable of having these discussions in a mature fashion well there's um, got to be nuance there right right there's, exactly so maybe walk us through what are we talking about an apology for well sure the the nature by which the, the the means that we're saying these things, the the means by which we're saying these things, the uh, the tone with which we're saying these things. We're not trying to spike the football or slam dunk or rub it in people's faces or say, hey, because you did this, you're now African queen. Um, you are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever. You you don't get to call mm -hmm. your spiritual fathers names and whatnot. It's okay mm -hmm. to report on what they did, and we mm -hmm. should be reporting on what they did. And mm -hmm. you know. I think some Catholic media outfits have, again, whistled past the graveyard and mm -hmm. not looked where they should have been doing uh, probing and prodding. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't have been on the Boston Globe to mm -hmm. police the church. I think it should have been on our outfits to do mm -hmm. it in just the right way, because, of course, the Boston Globe stuff was weaponized by the left to, to take aim at the church, to try and undermine the church. If we had done it uh, as Catholic media organizations, then we could have done it with just the right nuance to be like, hey, guys, stay on board the bark of Peter. And yet there's this rot and filth that needs mm -hmm. to come out. There mm -hmm. is truly a lavender mafia that has been getting people in to the priesthood that did not have vocations. You know, read goodbye, good men mm -hmm. there. There is truth to some of this. And even Pope Francis has has commended that, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's what people don't understand. Pope Francis himself has been like, yes, we must address this problem. Uh, he's done it on smaller channels. You know, he hasn't mm -hmm. done it in a mainstream way, but he has said things and it's in public record. Um, you know, but going and saying, stay on board the bark of Peter, despite mm -hmm. these problems and let's fix the rot and get these people out who do not be belong in parish life and let's not cover it up. Let's give victims of sex assault and sex abuse their their restitution all of that stuff that's a good thing to do but do it from within the church uh do not do it by saying uh screw you bishops uh if you'll pardon the phrase um mm -hmm. you know you have no you've lost your power or you are pieces of trash now and i can just run away at the mouth and vomit out whatever vulgarities come into my mind because you've done something wicked it's not how it yeah. works it's like what christ says about the pharisees yeah and even pope francis i mean to his credit came out and condemned some of that excessive behavior and spoke of there being a media outlet in the united states i think he's referring to the world over uh that was uh doing the work of the devil is the way he described it uh because of its constant slander and bearing false witness against the successor of saint peter um yeah yeah to the extent that people do that 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 is the work of the devil and so we we certainly have to be guarded there um so i appreciate that balance take that you're offering um let's maybe talk about your opinion on what the future direction of church militant might be any any comments here well because of the bleed of staff michael um mm -hmm. of many of the good members of staff i i fear for it i don't think at this point anyone should support it under the current board of directors uh it's a rudderless ship 
And I think they're scrambling to stay alive. And I don't think what matters, uh, you know, the truth of the Christian gospel and bringing the truth of the Christian gospel to light in the correct way is it is front and center for them. So I need I think there needs to be a reckoning. Now, if the current board of directors would step down because they're weak, they respond to public outrage, then if we could get a new board of directors in there that were faithful, all of the employees who had left would come back, or at least the lion's share of employees, the faithful employees who'd left, would go right back to work the next day. We would pledge allegiance to the Pope, the Magisterium. You know, we would take the oath of fidelity to the Magisterium, say, as prerequisite for working here, you have to take the profession of faith. Um, and then we would issue public apologies to all the people we've slandered or defamed and um, work to put out edifying content, not scandal mongering anymore, mm. not, um, you know, knocking our bishops or having an antagonistic attitude towards them. Mm. Rather, you know, we'd get to work doing what was in our mission statement that drew us in the very first place. Mm -hmm. That could be the direction of church militant. The only thing that's holding it back is a very weak, rudderless board of directors. And if those people would would step down and kind of, you know, name successors, name a successor board that is made up of the right people, church militants fortunes could be turned around. It has the infrastructure. And even though its name has been tarnished, it has what's called goodwill. You know, the mm -hmm. difference between just its raw assets and its actual value um, because people know of it. It's a known entity. Some people like it. Some people like its programming. It could draw on that goodwill to, again, um, gain, gain prominence and a reputation for doing the right stuff. So it's actually fixable, but it is not fixable in its current iteration. Um, so there's, a, there's hope there. I, I hope people will make their voices known because it truly is. There are a lot of really good people that work there. Like people, mm -hmm. I've seen comments like, oh, I'm losing faith. You know, all these Catholic men are falling. Like I could name 10 people that worked at, at Church Militant that were much more, you know, pious than uh, that I would assign, you know, personally, if I had to say are probably much holier guys than than Voris, than the figurehead. Um, so that was my hope for it. But if it's going to go in the iteration, I in the direction I fear it's going to go and it's under the current board of directions it or directors, it will, it will die out and it needs to die out. Did you say that the, um, the content creators at church militant did not have to make the profession of faith or they did? Um, no, I think it was, I'm not exactly sure. I was never, I was never asked to do that and i suggested mm -hmm. it in meetings and it was just more like well everybody just believes it anyway so there's no reason for that sort of thing you know we've mm -hmm. we've maybe there's some analogous thing that people had to go through i don't recall that i ever did i don't want to be misspeaking my memories i've got like dad brain like each mm -hmm. one of my children that is born i lose at least 10 to 15 iq points so <laughs> i forget <laughs> I hear you. Well, um, you know, I want to give you a chance to maybe respond to some of the questions. I'm not going to choose the questions for you. Um, you, you can, if you want to pick out any questions or comments from the chat section, anything that is to at reason and theology, feel free to grab it or pass over it. Um, if there's anything that really even catches your eye, I, I don't know if y'all want to put some questions there in the chat again, make sure to, um, put them to at reason and theology. Are, are you able to see the chats? Yeah, I can see them. I'm trying to look for, let's see here. Did CM have a patron saint that we can call it? Well, St. Michael, you know, St. Michael's mm -hmm. media. Um, and we all had, you know, we would hope that mother Angelica is, is a saint one day, but you know, that's somebody that we, our control room was named after Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen studios. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's somebody that I would, you know, invoke in prayer, uh, to, to pray for the conversion of church militant, but St. Michael, especially, you know, at the mm -hmm. core the 501 C three is St. Michael's media. 
Yeah. And Pope Francis said that Mother Angelica is in heaven. So is that like a quasi canonization? <laughs> you know? Right. Oh, yeah, sure. No problem. I know um, it's not a formal canonization. <laughs> sure. No, of course. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's like a quasi one. <laughs> she was definitely instrumental in my own coming back to the faith. You know, I was a cradle Catholic and not even like a bad cradle Catholic. You know, we'd go to confession and stuff as a family. But just in high school, a lot of stuff really challenged my faith. I um, went to Catholic school, heard the typical nonsense. So oh, Jesus is the son of God, but so is Buddha. So is Muhammad. Um, squishier religion classes and whatnot. And I kind of drifted away between mm -hmm. like late high school and, and mid college. Um and Mother Angelica really helped bring me back to that. So I, you know, was living like a neo-pagan for a, a few years there. And uh, Mother Angelica really, you know, and DWTN particularly helped me come back to my senses and understand that, um, you know, we're called to something transcendental, not just the things of this world. So I'm very much indebted to some of the good people at EWTN, Mitch Pacwa, um, Father Mitch Pacwa, and Mother Angelica. And, you know, I hate to say it because of his situation now, but Father Karapi was one of the first like clerics that I heard preach like an actual man. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so I would hope she's in heaven. I, I don't know. It's way obviously way beyond my pay grade, especially because I'm out of a job and I don't have a pay grade. Um, so uh, I I would go St. Michael on that. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any others that you wanted to grab or any parting words that you wanted to offer? Um, I would answer any question that people ask. Let me just look. Um, mm -hmm. are you concerned with saw something, uh, legal ramifications that CM may pursue? I'm hoping they'll try to retaliate. Uh, I'm not too concerned for one because, you know, like, it doesn't make any sense for them to try and come after me for two. They didn't sign my non-disclosure agreement and they, they forgot to sign it. And number three, it was drafted so badly that it doesn't look like it's an actual binding contract because there's no consideration laid out in it. Um, and it also seemingly would transcend common law rules for, you know, a contract and, um, you know, like a unilateral contract because it says it needs to be signed by both parties. So I don't think so. But, um, you know, like, I guess I'm an attorney. So if they try and sue me, it's going to cost them a lot more than me. So come at me, bro. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. I hear you. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, hey, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. This was incredibly helpful. I want to remind everybody to go and check out that link that I have there in the show notes if you want to uh, help support, you know, Dave and others uh, who are at Church Militant, if you'll consider supporting them and also consider supporting me here with Reason and Theology patreon.com forward slash reason and theology another great way to do it if you can't financially support is of course through your prayers and also hit that subscribe button please help me grow this channel so i can reach more people with the information that you appreciate and love here at reason and theology so hit the like button hit the subscribe button dave thank you so much for coming on and doing this i really do appreciate it Thanks so much for having me, Michael. I, I really enjoy our these collabs we've been doing. Um, and thank you for, I, I say it every time, but thank you for your ministry. I think what you're doing is just right on the money. And it's like the thing for our times. When so much confusion is coming from uh, radical traditionalists, having somebody that is an Orthodox Catholic, who's not some theological liberal uh, opposing that, it's really important, you know, that the, the opposition to the bad ideas from the Rad Trides is not coming from America magazine mm -hmm. or National Catholic Reporter, that it's coming from a son of the church. And that gives you extra uh, ethos, extra credibility in this way. Um, Thank you. you. It's really important doing what you're doing. So we're all, you know, I, all my friends were like, oh, dude, you listen to Lofton and stuff. Um, they've liked you for for since you were you know a smaller channel mm -hmm. um so thank you for what you've done oh i really appreciate it and i look forward to more collaborative um uh, efforts between us so yeah let, let's do some more shows more content i'd love that 100 percent. you know i'm on board 
Absolutely. All right, y'all hit the subscribe button and the like button. We'll see you later. God bless.